Thank you very much for staying with us in this session. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Joanne Baird for the summary and the conclusions. Joanne is Director of the Department of Education, University of Oxford and Professor in Educational Assessment. Joanne's research in educational assessment, examination standards, marking and assessment design has greatly influenced educational assessment policy in the UK. She is a member of Ofqual's Standing Advisory Group and Chair of AQA's Research Committee was Standing Advisor to the House of Commons Education Select Committee and a member of the Welsh Government's Curriculum and Assessment Group. Joanne will be summarising uh, and we're looking forward very much to your comments, Joanne, and your, your take on how the afternoon has gone. I hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Susan. I'd, I'd really like to say what a privilege it's been to host today's conference um, at Oxford University's Department of Education in collaboration with the, the Edan Foundation. And although we can't be together in person in these times, actually holding the conference online has meant that it's been a more inclusive live event, which we've been really grateful for. So over 1,000 people from 114 countries around the world have registered, including teachers, policy makers, people from charity foundations, even universities. And, and more. And we can anticipate far more views online and ultimately the conference might be accessed from someone from every country across the globe. So it really has been um, quite an achievement. And after all, Ch Charles Chen's vision for the Edan Prize is to improve education everywhere. So we hope that this conference has gone some way um, to doing that. We've witnessed a series of inspirational contributions today and yesterday at the first International Edan Prize Doctoral Conference. It's fantastic to see the launch of students' careers through international presentations such as this. I really enjoyed listening to them. And the special recognition of the work of the winners of the Edan Doctoral Prizes is fantastic. And they were, of course, the Queen Sum from University of Oxford, Junping Shui from University College London, Lydia Lim Perez from Newcastle University, Anino Grady from University of Oxford, and Yizun Deng from Harvard University. Competition for this prize was fierce and the award is highly prestigious, so congratulations to all of them. Now the theme of today's conference on innovation and education is incredibly important. And these days of the pandemic, we're all becoming so accustomed to our online working conditions and our minds automatically turn to the notion of technological innovation. Charles Chen's contribution to technological innovation is apparent and it's clearly the way of the future. But the EDAN Prize is important for its recognition of wider forms of innovation. Today's sub-themes on a human-centric approach to motivation and a scientific approach to teaching recognised the need for broader forms of innovation related to pedagogy and relationships. Now, yesterday, Professor Rebecca N. Einan from the University of Oxford reminded us in her keynote address at the doctoral conference that if we're not careful, we'll sleepwalk into a world in which learning relationships are mediated by technology. Robots and algorithms could define learning goals and behaviours in ways that are not completely understood and that ultimately are not desirable. And today, Dr. C.B. Tawil from UNESCO gives a very thoughtful keynote address, drawing our attention to the philosophy of innovation, what the term means and what our underlying purposes might be in innovating. He reminds us that even if we're enthusiastic about innovation for itself, that it's really a vehicle for better educational and social opportunities. Equity, he argued, is the key criterion and lens for deciding whether an innovation is desirable. Some of the things we call innovation might in fact be unnecessary disruption, he said. And he drew upon an example in the US which showed that only 20% of the innovation interventions in a highly funded programme had any positive effect on student learning. He also argued that innovation is expected to be transformative in a way that changes things overnight. But this, he said, is based upon logics from other fields, such as technology. And the logic doesn't follow in education. Social and educational change, he said, is more incremental 
It needs long and concerted effort. And this is a, a lesson, I think, for all of us from today. He cautioned us to recognise that people, not technology, drives innovation. The most important innovations do not involve technology at all, but they do not always get labelled as innovation because we're so accustomed to seeing human, humans innovate and to thinking about innovation as technological. He took the important example of how schooling has been more inclusive to the poor and to girls um, that, that those um, interventions that have made those uh, schooling systems more inclusive have not been about technology at all. Again, then, we're reminded of the need for critical evaluation of innovation and especially technological innovation. Education is about creating and sustaining social value, he said. We then had a fantastic um, panel um, looking at a human-centred approach and um, how motivation affects behaviour. Lucy Lake from CAMFED drew our attention to the various dynamics inside and out of school that exclude girls. Vicky argued that making schools more inclusive made better schools for all. Angeline Muruwira from CAMFED outlined how a new role of learning guides mattered for engaging girls in school, in part because they understand the lived realities of poverty, poverty and the practical as well as psychological issues that occur on a daily basis. These learning guides bring the curriculum alive for young girls in many ways, bridging, um, building bridges between schooling and the community. Harry Daniels from Oxford University shared his interest in some negative motivations which lead to disengagement. Knowing more about these negative motivations will help us to address them so that we can include children in education. During the pandemic, experience of the effects of exclusion from school has been widespread and we've all become familiar with at least some of the effects, such as upon people's mental health. Vicky Colbert from Fundacion Escuela Nueva outlined the various ways in which her school network transformed young people's experiences in schools. They've taken a systematic approach that would be scalable and feasible. The new role of the teacher in Escuela Nueva is as a mentor and facilitator, and the schools promote leadership in children. The philosophy is to change the learning environment and pedagogy. So in each of these ways, panel members outlined why a human-centric approach is essential in education. Our final panel on a scientific approach to improving teaching also um, actually outlined quite diverse voices at times in terms of what we should be prioritising. Carl Wieman from Stanford University spoke about his research on the teaching of science in higher education, his use of problem solving activities and feedback targeted to individual learning demonstrated his views of good pedagogical practice in science. The use of simulations, which have been widely adopted online, has allowed the exploration of scientific effects in ways that would have been much more difficult in standard laboratory conditions. Sibel Ergeran from Oxford University drew our attention to the way in which scientific subjects are taught without cross-subject links, which results in disconnected learning and does not empower students to think innovatively, which she argued often involves interdisciplinary thinking. She drew upon an example in Germany in which a philosopher and, dare I say, even a historian were included in managing the pandemic. Disciplines, she argued, are important but interdisciplinary approaches are also important for understanding the real world problems that we all face. Thomas Kane from Harvard University talked about the transformative effect of effective teachers on student attainment and later earnings. Investing in the quality of teaching is the single most important thing that public policy can do, he argued. Only policies that change what teachers do in classrooms will be effective in improving quality. We need to focus upon what effective classroom practice looks like and also on how we change teacher behaviour. And one of the key levers for behaviour change, she said, was allowing teachers to identify their own pedagogical behaviours, which at times might need to be adapted. Larry Hedges from Northwestern University spoke to us about evidence-informed approaches to education. He reminded us that there are too many fads 
and that we don't evaluate interventions systematically enough. And perhaps there's an issue about how educational research is funding that relates to that nature of the field. Larry drew attention to the fact that we might need to be more realistic about effect sizes of interventions in education. He said that synthesizing and communicating research findings are important elements of the educational science ecology. Larry's view of the way in which teacher education needs to be research informed really resonated well with the approach that we take here in the Department of Education at Oxford University. So he will have a, had a friendly ear amongst colleagues here. Amongst this panel of scientific educators, with my own disciplinary background being in psychology, I found myself slightly shamed faced and questioning just how much neuroscience really has to offer us at this point in term, time, in terms of understanding of learning, never mind the improvement of teaching. From an educational perspective, I think neuroscience is still at a very rudimentary stage. So to summarise, our second panel gave us distinctive views on what needs to be done to make our approach to improving teaching more scientific. Now to conclude, from the Department of Education at the University of Oxford, I offer our warmest congratulations to all of the 2020 EDAN Prize winners, Lucy Lake, Angeline Muruwira and Carl Wieman. May your work continue to inspire real innovation in education. And with that, I'll hand you back to Dr. Susan James Reilly, who's been leading all of the work in this conference on behalf of the department. Thank you, Joanne. What an amazing summary. Um, has, has highlighted perfectly um, the afternoon and all that has come out of, um, uh, out of it. And I think today's conference has been so important for furthering discussions on what is innovation in education. It's been an inspiration. Um, I do hope you have enjoyed it as much as I have and that these conversations will continue outside of this conference. Um, they certainly need to if we are to tackle any of the problems that have been made even more evident from the pandemic, the inequalities in education. An event like this does not happen without a lot of planning and a lot of hard work. I owe a sincere debt of gratitude and thanks to the team at Oxford, Ashmita, Fang, Darshni and Jocelyn, thank you. This team worked in conjunction with our UDAN Prize Foundation colleagues, Mabel and Joy, who are in the audience and have been amazing in their clarity, insight and guidance. Thank you. It was a truly collaborative experience and team of amazing women that I have been privileged to work with to bring this conference to you. In addition, there were so many people behind the scenes at both the Department of Education and the UDAN Foundation um, who have worked beyond measure for this conference. A huge thank you to them. Thank you to our speakers, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Oxford, Professor Louise Richardson, Sobi, Lucy, Angie, Vicky, Harry, Carl, Sibel, Thomas, Larry, Joanne, amazing education researchers. Thank you for all of your research work and your words today, which are truly inspirational. Finally, a special mention to Dr. Charles Chan Yinan, whose name is on this conference. A visionary for quality education and equality in education the world over. Thank you. See us here. Have a good afternoon and evening. One and.